Good morning and welcome once again to our sermon for Sunday, September the 13th. We have not started meeting back in our sanctuary yet, as you can see here behind me, but we did have our first outdoor worship service this morning at 8.30 in our uh, church playground. And as long as the weather is uh, good on Saturday night and on Sunday morning, we will continue to have the, that service. It's just a, an abbreviated service. You bring your lawn chair, bring your mask from home, and observe social distancing guidelines. And we just simply gather out under the big tree in our playground and just have a, a short time of worship um, at 8.30. So we'll do it again next Sunday if the weather is uh, if the weather accommodates us. So you're welcome to join us there. Uh, and I will also continue to keep posting uh, these sermons um, on Facebook and our YouTube channel. This month we're working through a sermon series called Progressive Sanctification in which we are exploring the subject of growing and maturing in our Christian faith. The phrase progressive sanctification was coined by John Wesley to refer to the process by which believers are supposed to continue moving forward in their spiritual growth. I invite you to turn to our scripture reading for this morning. It is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 4. We kicked off the series last Sunday, and we talked about the evidence that will be shown as we grow and the resources that God makes available to help us grow. God's plan for all living things is birth, growth, and full maturity. We recognize this pattern immediately in the physical world. Um, and for ourselves, personally, we take care of ourselves, we uh, take vitamins, we exercise, we do uh, regular trips to the doctor to ensure that we are growing uh, properly. We expect growth and development in our children and our grandchildren. Not long after our youngest son, Matthew, was born, um, he began to experience some growth deficiency. And uh, after a while, we realized that he was not on track with his height and weight where he needed to be. Um, the doctors had a chart with height and weight and all that stuff, and and he never could quite seem to get onto that chart. Or, or if he did get on the chart, it was like at the very, very bottom. Um, he just was simply not growing the way that he should have been. Um, he was healthy in every other regard except that. So we went through uh, rounds of tests and eventually discovered that his body was not producing growth hormone the way it should. So after a lot of red tape and more tests and lots of run-ins with the insurance company, Matthew was finally approved for a daily growth hormone injection. And we gave him that injection every day for several years to help him grow properly. You know, it's interesting if someone we love isn't growing properly properly, whether that's maybe physically or, or mentally or emotionally, we stop at nothing to figure out why that is. But you know, the same doesn't hold true for our growth in the church, does it? It's often neglected or ignored. The church puts a lot of emphasis upon salvation and conversion, and rightly so but then it often neglects our ongoing spiritual growth after that point. And so as a result, some Christians remain spiritual infants. The Apostle Paul understood this all too well. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Message Translation, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. But for right now, friends... I'm completely frustrated by your unspiritual dealings with each other and with God. You're acting like infants 
in relation to Christ, capable of nothing more than nursing at the breast. Well then, I'll nurse you since you don't seem capable of anything more. As long as you grab for what makes you feel good or makes you look important, are you really much different than a babe at the breast? Content only when everything's going your way? When one of you says, I'm on Paul's side, and another says, I'm for Apollos, aren't you being totally infantile? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Paul had planted the church in Corinth, but a number of thorny problems had cropped up. The believers there were, many of the believers there were arrogant in their presumed spirituality. Uh, they misunderstood the Lord's Supper. They accused Paul of not being a real apostle. And they played power and control games in the congregation. All of these things, of course, point back to the root problem. The Corinthian Christians had not grown in their faith. Their progressive sanctification hadn't progressed. And as a result, they were acting like spiritual babies. So how do we recognize the spiritual infant? Somebody who may have been Christian for years, somebody who may have been in church for decades, and yet remain spiritually immature. What are some of the indications of infancy? The first indication of infancy is that spiritual infants are more concerned with self than they are with service. Folks who don't progress in their sanctification are obsessively focused on their own personal wants and wishes. They believe that everything in the church should center on them and that their needs take precedence over everything else. If you have ever been part of a church somewhere, then you may have encountered someone like this. Spiritual infants do not mind throwing a fit, withholding their money, spreading gossip or dissent, or bullying in order to get what they want. You know, every time that there is a birth, whether it is a spiritual birth or a physical birth, there's a lot of rejoicing. Jesus said in Luke 15, 7, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Whenever anyone is brought into God's kingdom, there's naturally a celebration. And the, the same is true for physical birth. When a, a new baby enters the world, man, all eyes are on that baby, aren't they? I can remember when our two boys were born. As I'm sure you can remember the births of your children or your grandchildren. Friends and family came. Everyone was so excited. The, the, the baby is held and he is passed around and she is cuddled and made over and we, we count little fingers and toes and we rub the heads and ooh and ah and, and just make a great fuss over this new young life, little life. The thing is, infants become accustomed to that kind of attention. And infants also get upset over very small things, what we consider small things, but to them, they're big things because they may need to be changed or fed or they may need sleep, that sort of thing. They cry and scream when they don't get their way. One of the things that we have to teach our children and our grandchildren is that as they get older, the world revolves less and less around them. They are not the focus of every, every moment's attention like they were when they were infants. The spiritually immature Christian is likewise accustomed to having all the attention. They get upset over the smallest things. And they often have to be handled with the utmost delicacy. In fact, they can sometimes be like 
time bombs just waiting to explode if things don't go their way. They may threaten to leave the church if people don't acquiesce to their demands. There's a joke you may have heard of a a man who was stranded on a desert island in the Pacific for a number of years. One day a boat sailed into view and the man lit a fire and he waved frantically and he, he got the boat's attention. And so a rowboat was let down and a sailor rowed over to the island where the man was. And as he pulled the boat up onto the sand, he saw three huts built there on the island. And and he asked the castaway, he said, well, what are those? And the man said, well, the first hut, that's where I live. And the second hut, that's where I go to church. And the sailor said, well, what's the third hut for? And the man said, oh, well, that's where I used to go to church. Paul told the Corinthian Christians that they were acting like babies in verses 2 and 3. As long as you grab for what makes you feel good or makes you look important, are you really much different than a babe at the breast, content only when everything's going your way? The Corinthian congregation was more concerned with their wants and their wishes than with service. Their comfort and their convenience came before the good of the church. They didn't have time to serve others because they were too focused on getting their own way. A spiritual infant is someone who is a receiver and rarely ever a giver. They look at everything from the perspective of what can they get out of it. They will fuss and argue over rights and privileges to make sure things go just the way they want them to. Back in 2002, when I was a youth pastor, I led our youth group on a mission trip to St. Simons Island, Georgia. And our group was at a work site, and there were uh, several other youth groups from different, uh, different states, different areas there as well. And one day, some of the youth in our group overheard the youth in another group complaining about the work that they were being asked to do. It wasn't the work that they wanted to do. And we actually heard some of the youth say, we didn't come all this way just to dig up tree stumps, which was what we had been doing for a day or two. That was part of the work that they had asked us to do. Like spiritual infants, they wanted everything their way. It had to be just what they wanted or they would kick up a fuss. A second indication of infancy is that spiritual infants are more concerned with argument than with action. Envy, strife, and division are their main products. They feel the need to keep something stirred up in the church all the time. It keeps them in the spotlight where others can see them. At a former church I served, there was a man who was always looking for a fight. He could erupt in anger at the the slightest thing in the church. He had no joy. He had no real peace in his life. And he was always looking to complain and argue. And as a result, a lot of people didn't want to be around him. These immature believers would rather use their energy to destroy and tear down than to be constructive and build up. I once told an administrative board in a meeting that we were having that if we put even half the energy into reaching the lost and building the kingdom the way Jesus told us to, as we put into arguing and complaining and fault finding, the church wouldn't be big enough to hold everyone. At the church in Corinth, the people were arguing over theology and ethics, 
And while some of the questions they had were legitimate, such as how do we attain divine wisdom, uh, what actions constitute idolatry, and how should spiritual gifts be used and manifested in worship? Those were legitimate questions that they had. But they were also taking sides, and they were arguing with others in the church. They were allowing pride and division to control them. Paul called them out as what they were, infantile in their actions and their attitudes. He said that he would like to speak to them as if they were spiritual adults, but because of their selfish arguments, he had to treat them as if they were children. A third indication of infancy is that spiritual infants are more concerned with pleasing people than they are with pleasing God. The Corinthian church was separated into factions over leadership. When one of you says, I'm on Paul's side, and another says, I'm for Apollos, aren't you being totally infantile? Some in the Corinthian church believed that Paul was the best apostle. After all, he had started the church, so they, they were kind of in his camp. Others supported a guy named Apollos, um, who had visited Corinth. He had preached there, and by all scholarly accounts, was a better public speaker than Paul himself was. So they were in Apollos' camp. And then there was a third group. They were on Peter's side, since Peter was one of the, the original 12 disciples of Jesus. Each little faction was concerned with keeping others happy and pleasing the people in their own little camps. Often, the person that an immature believer is trying to please is a bully or a controller in the church. And they join forces around a favorite gripe or an old complaint or a pastor in the past who coddled them or just the good old days when so-and-so was here. I have witnessed with my own eyes how a select few in the church were kept fat, happy, and satisfied by everyone else rather than doing what Jesus commanded us to do. I have experienced controllers and bullies furious about a change to the order of service that happened three years ago or a piece of pulpit furniture that was moved or a decision that a committee made that didn't fit with their own personal agendas. Paul, writing in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, remarked on who we should be seeking to please. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, Paul wrote, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. It's kind of like the, there's a, a, a little picture that makes its way around uh, social media from time to time, and it says, um, if you want everyone to like you, don't be a pastor, sell ice cream instead. Kind of that same sort of, uh, same sort of uh, attitude. Paul faced tremendous resistance because he was focused and he was determined to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. His focus was heavenly. He wanted to please God above all else. Paul did not cater to the whims of people. But now, lest we think, you know, I know someone like that. Before we assume that this sermon is for someone else, well, you know, so-and-so should have been here. She really needed to hear this sermon. Before we do that, let's take a look at our own attitudes and actions first. 
Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 4, to take the plank out of your own eye before trying to remove a speck from someone else's eye. None of us are perfect. No one is beyond the reach of spiritual pride. We can all allow immature actions and attitudes to creep into our lives. So let's tread cautiously and search our own hearts first and foremost. Spiritual infancy isn't, or it doesn't have to be, permanent. In fact, the point of progressive sanctification is to progress, is to go forward. The purpose of it is to move away from the things that hold us back so that we can follow and serve and love more faithfully. No one has to remain a spiritual infant. But many choose to because the alternative, surrender and growth, takes them out of their comfort zones. And it requires them to release their control in the church and with people. Babies, they are wonderful things. They are cute and cuddly. We marvel at them. We, we marvel at the miracle of birth that brings them into the world. We're stunned and hopeful by the, 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 the hopes and future that, that lie ahead of them. But the same can't be said for the spiritually immature Christian who refuses to grow. I'm not talking about someone who's just come to Christ, who is young in their faith, who is spiritually immature in their faith because they have just come to Christ. I'm talking about those who choose to remain spiritual infants. Unlike the newborn baby who cannot choose to grow up, it just happens. The baby doesn't just sit there and say, hey, you know what, I think today I'll decide to grow a little bit. No, it just happens for them. But when it comes to spiritual growth, we have to make that choice. It has to be a decision to progress in our sanctification. And God is always present to help us do that. He supplies us, as we said last week, with the grace that is necessary to grow. He sets before us the example of Jesus to imitate and to pursue. He grants us strength and courage and knowledge so that we can change our actions and our behaviors. So this morning in our time of response to God's word, let's take a moment before the Lord in silence. And I invite you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your heart what it is today that you need to help you continue to mature as the beloved child of God that you are. If you'll just hit pause on the video, let us pray in silence. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you again for joining me. And I would like to leave you with this blessing and this benediction. It comes from the Russian Orthodox prayer book. It's adapted from the prayer of St. Macarius the Great. Receive this blessing and this benediction. To you, our master, lover of men. May we leave to do your work as we walk kept free from every worldly evil thing and from every attack of the evil one. Lead us in the way eternal, now and forever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen.